This is Dr. Jerry Tunnett. Welcome to this uh, session on macular degeneration. I was uh, instrumental in changing the way ophthalmology was practiced during my lifetime. I developed the techniques to safely implant intraocular lenses after cataract surgery, uh, eliminating the disablingly thick cataract glasses. I developed better and safer intraocular lenses. I developed the watertight beveled incision to allow immediate ambulation after cataract surgery, eliminating the need for patients to stay in bed for two to three weeks after cataract surgery. I developed a plastic dome patch to be used after eye surgery to avoid the unnecessary and uncomfortable pressure of standard patches. I developed the techniques for saving eyes that hemorrhage during surgery. With the anesthesiologist Monty Hellman, I developed the techniques for safe outpatient eye surgery and opened the first outpatient eye surgery center in Texas. I lobbied Congress to pay for outpatient surgery, resulting in savings of billions of dollars and patients avoiding the hazards of hospitalization, including falling in strange surroundings, hospital infections, hospital medication errors, etc. Along with Dr. McIntyre and Dr. Williamson, I started the Outpatient Ophthalmic Surgery Society to teach ophthalmologists how to safely perform outpatient eye surgery. I trained ophthalmologists around the world to safely perform intraocular lens surgery. This included textbooks about cataract surgery, intraocular lens surgery, and phaco emulsification. I did the majority of the FDA studies for the Visex laser for use in refractive surgery such as LASIK. With Dr. John Corboy and Dr. Malcolm Ng, I was the catalyst for forming the Royal Hawaiian Eye Meeting, the third largest eye meeting in the world. I developed new theories explaining that acupuncture meridians are actually stacks of rechargeable muscle batteries forming a power pack for every organ in the body. I found that the power supply to the macula is the stomach acupuncture meridian. I found that the power supply to the optic nerve and retina is the liver acupuncture meridian. I found that the power supply to the drainage system of the eye, that is the problem in glaucoma, is a sympathetic acupuncture meridian. So macular degeneration involves degeneration of the part of the retina where the light focuses. So let's take a look at the theory that I have for understanding the root cause of macular degeneration. Now the American Academy of Ophthalmology and most medical societies state that the cause of macular degeneration is unknown. I am presenting a theory in this uh, video of the cause of macular degeneration with the hope that others will either prove or disprove my theory. No official organization has studied my theories to prove or disprove them. To support or dispute my theories, I routinely use objective scientific tests to indicate whether macular degeneration's progressive loss of vision can be influenced. The tests include the following. We, of course, take standard uh, visual acuity tests as measured with a standard Snellen chart using the best available glasses prescription both before and after therapies. In addition, we use a device called OCT or optical coherence tomography, which is a non-invasive diagnostic technique that renders an in vivo cross-sectional view of the retina, including the macula. It utilizes a concept known as interferometry to create a cross-sectional map that is accurate to within 10 or 15 microns. We also use OCTA, which is a, a form of angiography or measuring and defining the circulation of the eye. This is particularly useful in monitoring blood vessels involved in wet macular degeneration. So one can see if those are there and if they change during the therapy process. We also test uh, using electroretinogram. This tests the function of the visual system from in front of the eye, through the eye, and the retina through the optic nerve to the back of the brain, which is the occipital lobe, and then to the front of the brain, which is the frontal lobes. These are objective tests that give scientific validation of whether macular degeneration has been influenced in each and every patient. 
These tests are performed by an independent technician and placed in the patient's record before seeing Dr. Tennant. Since the macular cells are replaced every two to three days, patients with wet macular degeneration are examined, treated for three or four days, and then re-examined with the same tests. The tests are then shown to the patient so that each patient can personally review the results and make a personal decision about whether to continue the recommended therapies at home or not. The results are also available to the patient's personal physicians upon the patient's request. So let's look at my theory of macular degeneration. It is critical to recognize that the body is constantly wearing itself out. Cells must be replaced uh, in the macula every 48 hours, in the lining of the gut every three days, your skin is replaced every six weeks, the liver is replaced every eight weeks, your nervous system is replaced every eight months. Here you can see <clears throat> some other published data about how the body rebuilds itself every 365 days. So one must realize that chronic diseases only occur when we lose the ability to make new cells at work. Let me say that again. Chronic disease only occurs when we lose the ability to make new cells at work. So that leads us to the obvious question, what's it take to make a new cell that works? Well, cells run at minus 25 millivolts of electron donor, but it requires minus 50 millivolts to make new cells. In addition, we must have all the materials that are necessary to make new cells. This is called nutrition and requires a functional digestive system, including stomach acid. One cannot have all of the things you need to make new cells if your stomach acid has been shut down with pharmaceuticals. We must deal with any toxins that destroy cells as fast as we make them. The most common toxins are heavy metals like mercury, dental toxins, and GMO foods with a pesticide called Roundup or glyphosate. Now the body has five battery packs. So every organ in the body has its own battery pack. Our muscles are piezoelectric, which means every time you move them, they generate electrons and they're also rechargeable batteries. In addition, these battery packs go through the teeth and each tooth acts as a circuit breaker. The voltage then goes to the cell membranes. Our cell membranes are small batteries called capacitors. Inside the cell membranes is an electron donor form of water, which has been termed easy or uh, easy zone water, which is an electron donor form of water in the form of H3O2. Then we have the mitochondria. Inside the mitochondria, we have a rechargeable battery system called ADP ATP. When the battery is charged up, it's called ATP. When it's discharged, it's called ADP. And thus we have also a battery charger within the mitochondria, which is called the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. Fatty acids go through this Krebs cycle and it generates electrons to change the discharged ADP into the charged battery form of ATP. And then we also have a, a form of battery uh, inside the DNA. Scalar energy implodes inside the DNA to provide the power and energy for the DNA to work properly. Now, if we look at the muscle battery packs, our muscles are, as I mentioned, rechargeable batteries stacked one on top of each other, like stacking batteries in a flashlight to form a battery pack. And again, every organ has its own battery pack, including the macula. A stack of muscle batteries, what's been called an acupuncture meridian. Uh, in this example, we look at the uh, acupuncture meridian or battery pack called the spleen meridian. So the spleen meridian begins underneath the big toe, goes up the inside of the leg, a special branch goes to the female genitalia, goes around the back where it gets the adrenal glands, the spleen and the pancreas, goes up into the neck and makes a loop, and hooks into what's called the stomach circuit. Now the spleen and stomach circuit are actually the same wire or same circuit, but the one that goes up is called spleen, the one that comes back down is called stomach. And just as it makes this bend, it goes to the macula of the eye. 
So anyone who has macular degeneration has lost power in their stomach circuit. Let me say that one more time. Anyone who has macular degeneration has lost power in their stomach circuit. So it's important to realize that uh, without the necessary voltage for the cells to work and without the necessary voltage to make new cells when they wear out, you end up with cells missing and thus you have what's called macular degeneration. Now any place in the body where there is both inflammation and, and a defect from not making new cells, the body puts down a waxy substance called beta amyloid. The, when this happens in the retina, they appear as these kind of yellow spots or bumps in the retina, and these have been named drusen. So any eye doctor will tell you that when they begin to see drusen, they know that you are on your road to developing dry macular degeneration. So again, when we look at the stomach circuit after it makes the bend and goes to the macula, it goes to the frontal lobes of the eye, the, uh, of the brain, the cornea of the eye, the thyroid, the breast, the stomach, the male genitalia, including the prostate gland, and then down to the big toe. So we have six of these loops of muscle batteries intended to provide the minus 25 millivolts needed for cells to work and the minus 50 millivolts to make new cells when they wear out or become damaged. So we obviously become ill when one or more of these battery packs won't hold a charge. Now to understand the progression from dry, so-called dry to wet macular degeneration, you must realize that one of the things that determines the amount of oxygen that will dissolve in water is dictated by the voltage of the water. So if you take a glass of water and you put a tube in and start bubbling oxygen in, the amount of oxygen that will dissolve is dictated in part by the voltage. So if you raise the voltage of the water, more oxygen goes into solution. However, if you lower the voltage in the water, oxygen comes out of solution and disappears. Well, our cells, including the macular cells, are about 70 to 90% water. So as we lower the voltage in the stomach circuit, then oxygen comes out of solution, out of the cells, and the cells become hypoxic or that means they have inadequate amounts of oxygen. Now, any place in the body where there's inadequate oxygen, the body tends to grow in new little blood vessels in order to try to bring in more oxygen to the cells that are struggling because they don't have enough oxygen. When that happens in the macula, this is called wet macular degeneration. Now, these blue, new blood vessels occur in the blood supply behind the retina, which is called the choroid. Now it's of some interest to note that the macula has a separate power supply and a separate blood supply from all of the rest of the eye. The rest of the retina is uh, the optic nerve and retina are on a different circuit and have a different blood supply. They're on the liver circuit with the blood vessels of the retina supplying them. However, the macula itself is on the stomach circuit with uh, the blood vessels coming in from behind the eye from the choroid. Now, anywhere in the body where there's deficient oxygen, the body makes these new blood vessels in an effort to supply more oxygen, and this is called angiogenesis, and is stimulated by vascular endothelial growth factor or VEGF. So <clears throat> in these images you can see the retina, you can see the choroid, and we use this uh, device called OCTA which gives us the ability to map the blood vessels in all the different layers of the retina and in the choroid so that we can actually see new blood vessels in the choroid if they're there, and we can also tell if we are able to alter those vessels and make them disappear with the therapies. Now in traditional ophthalmology, eye physicians inject drugs into the eye to collapse these tiny blood vessels. However, they always grow back since the lack of oxygen has not been addressed. So even after you inject these 
drugs into the eye to collapse those little blood vessels since the eye still has inadequate oxygen because it has inadequate voltage then these vessels always come back. Now oftentimes these vessels bleed into the macula and the bleeding into the macula not only obscures vision temporarily but it also causes scarring. <clears throat> In the lower image you can see this scarring and scarring cannot be corrected by the techniques that we are addressing with this theory. The, th the thing that we have shown is that we're able to assist the body in making new cells, but a new cell can't push a scar out of the way. So once the macula is scarred, then we do not have the ability to uh, adequately address that. So note that my theory of macular degeneration begins with the loss of voltage in the stomach circuit or stomach acupuncture meridian. And we've uh, identified five different things that can affect the foliage in any of the circuits. Not enough thyroid hormone, scars that block the flow of voltage across the circuit, dental infections, emotions, and toxins. So let's take a look at each of those. The thyroid hormone controls the voltage of every cell membrane in the body. Uh, that's under the control of the hormone T3 and the thyroid hormone T2 controls mitochondria. The thyroid process begins in the hypothalamus of the brain and is under control of adrenaline. And remember that the adrenal glands are under control of the spleen meridian. So when the spleen meridian, which is part of the spleen stomach circuit, goes out, you lose the adrenaline control of the hypothalamus and thus this whole thyroid process uh, becomes inadequate. Well, normally the hypothalamus makes thyroid or thyrotropic releasing hormone, which tells the pituitary to make thyroid stimulating hormone, which tells the thyroid to make T4, which then has to be converted to the active form of T3 using iodine, selenium, zinc, iron, cortisol, progesterone, and glutathione. If you're missing one of these cofactors, then you tend to make a, a fake hormone called reverse T3, which is sort of like a key that fits in the keyhole but won't turn the tumblers. Now docs are trained to look at TSH and occasionally they look at T4, but you can see that those two numbers, uh, blood tests could be normal, but if you can't convert T4 to the active form of T3, you can be 80% deficient at the cell membrane where it really matters and still have normal TSH and T4 blood tests. In addition, TSH actually stimulates the production of NIS or sodium iodine symporter. Now NIS takes iodine from the blood and carries it into the thyroid gland so the T4 can be made. Well, most people are deficient in iodine and thus they have deficient amount of NIS. So if you give the patient adequate amounts of iodine, then the pituitary actually recognizes that and makes more TSH in order to make more NIS so that more iodine can be carried into the thyroid gland. So what you notice is that as you begin to correct the iodine levels in people, it causes the TSH to go up. Now this is a temporary phenomenon and it goes up even more in people with Hashimoto's but nevertheless, if you do this slowly and adequately, then the body eventually catches up, the TSH goes back to normal, and the thyroid production becomes more normalized. Let's look at scars. So the body's wiring system is the fascia, that shiny, glossy material you see around the muscles of your Thanksgiving turkey. Now when you put a scar across the fascia, you begin to fray it so that now electrons can no longer go through it. It's very much like cutting across a, a copper wire and the ends fray. This of course blocks the ability of electrons to flow through that circuit and thus the voltage drops and that is how scars cause illnesses by interrupting the flow of voltage from the battery packs to the organs that are on that particular circuit. Now the circuit we've been looking at, the spleen stomach circuit, 
The most common scars are on the knee, on the breast, C-sections, and appendectomies. Now, if you have such scars, it will lower the voltage in the stomach circuit and thus have an influence on the amount of voltage that is available to the macula. Now, fortunately, one can use an essential oil blend along with the scalar energy from the biotransducer, and uh, this tends to rewind the, um, the uh, fascial wiring uh, because of the magnetic field generated by the scalar energy. This works about 90% of the time. Uh, about 10% of the time, uh, more effort is required to get the star scar to where it's no longer blocking the circuit. Then we have dental infections. Each one of the acupuncture circuits goes through very specific teeth, and this circuit we're looking at, the spleen stomach circuit, goes through the upper molars and the lower premolars. So if you think about this uh, molar here with this decay in it, you can see how a circuit going through this tooth would be blocked in some degree by the resistance of this decay. And of course, the more decay you have, the bigger resistor you have, and the more the voltage is dropped. However, the thing that drops the voltage the most is a root canal uh, tooth. So let's look at how a root canal procedure is done. Step-by-step -step look at a modern root canal procedure. Here is a healthy tooth. Inside the tooth, under the white enamel, is a hard tissue called dentin. Inside the dentin is a soft tissue called pulp. The pulp contains the tooth's nerves and blood vessels. It extends from the crown of the tooth into the roots of your teeth. If the pulp becomes inflamed or infected, your endodontist will remove it, relieving your pain or discomfort. Here's how root canal treatment works. First, your endodontist will numb the tooth so that you won't feel anything during the procedure. A small shield isolates the tooth, keeping it dry and clean. An opening is made through the crown of the tooth and into the pulp chamber. Fluid is put in the canals to kill any bacteria and help rinse out debris. Then, the pulp is removed. Using small instruments, the endodontist carefully cleans and shapes the canals. After the space is cleaned and shaped, the endodontist fills and seals the root canals. In most cases, a temporary filling is placed to close the opening until you see your dentist. After your endodontist is finished, you must return to your dentist to have your tooth properly restored with a filling or crown. So the dentists are the only physicians that think you can get away with leaving dead tissue in the body. No other doctor believes that. Now, Boyd Haley was considered by many to be the leading uh, human toxicologist at the University of Kentucky. And Dr. Haley has shown that one root canal shuts down 63% of your immune system. But in addition to, to uh, damage in the immune system, what you can see is that uh, it's uh, difficult for an electric current to go through such a tooth. Here in the upper left image, you can see where a root canal has been pulled, and you can see that the infection from the uh, dead tooth has spread into the bone around it. And what you see is that once you get infection in the bone, it's very much like uh, having a circuit breaker uh, in your home circuit breaker blow and that circuit simply shuts off. So having a, uh, an infection in the bone is very much like sticking a screwdriver in the wall socket. It's going to flip the circuit. And you can go keep flipping the circuit back on as many times as you want to, and it will keep flipping back off as long as the screwdriver is in the wall. Well, infection in a bone in, your, uh, in a, the jaw or around a tooth is very much like that. So no matter what you do, you can't overcome the effect of infection in the bone around the tooth. Now in the upper right image, you can see where there's infection where a tooth was pulled. Teeth are held into the bone by a ligament and 
Dentists are trained to simply wiggle the tooth loose from the ligament, take it out and put a stitch in and quit. Leaving this ligament behind oftentimes inhibits the bone healing. In addition, many people get infection in the bone in the few days after a tooth is pulled and this is often called a dry socket. It simply means there's infection in the bone. Well, infection can be in the bone for 40 or 50 years, not cause any pain, but it'll certainly shut off the circuit. Now let's look at emotions. Emotions are stored in the body as magnetic fields, very much like riding on a DVD rider. So in the left image, you can see a magnetic needle writes pictures on the DVD platter. So the body stores both memories and emotions very much in that same regard. Now when I use the word emotion I'm talking about a threatening event not a happy emotion. So um, in order to understand how we can influence this you have to realize that every organ system in the body runs at a different frequency very much like different radio stations. And also every different emotion has a different frequency. So anger has a different frequency than fear, which has a different frequency from worry, etc. And these tend to resonate with the various circuits. So anger gets stored in the liver gallbladder circuit, fear gets stored in the kidney bladder. And of course the circuit we're looking at is the spleen stomach tends to attract worry. Now to understand again how we can influence this I want you to think for a moment about an orchestra. If all of the instruments are in tune, it plays beautiful music. However, if one of the violins is out of tune, that's what you hear. You hear that violin screeching in spite of the rest of the orchestra's beautiful music. And so that's really the difference between a memory and an emotion because memories are stored in the body, in tune with the body, and the body's happy for them to be there. But emotions are the violin out of tune. Next you need to realize that the human body is an electromagnet and all electromagnets are surrounded by a magnetic field and in the human that field goes out about five feet or so and so whatever is stored in the body is reflected out into that magnetic field. So as you pass something that will interact with a um, magnetic field as you pass through the memories you don't feel any change because they're all compatible with the magnetic field but when you bump into an area that represents an emotion because it's the wrong frequency you can feel a resistance there it's very much like you're walking down the street and all of a sudden there's a puff of wind that hits you well because these uh, emotions are frequencies they can be tuned so and they can be tuned with scalar energy and so scalar energy is sound and the biotransducer are these are examples so when one bumps into this distortion or this resistance and one applies scalar energy it will tune it into a frequency that is compatible with the human body and what you've thus done is to tune an emotion into being just a memory. So for example, you drive around a curve and have a car wreck. Next time you go around the curve, your, your body responds, your pulse speeds up, you perspire, etc., because of the emotion of the wreck. Now if you tune the emotion of the wreck into being just a memory, then the next time you go around the curve, you simply say, oh, this is where I had my wreck but your body doesn't respond. And of course that opens the circuit so that it's no longer blocking the voltage in that circuit. Tuning emotions into being just memories is a very powerful way to help restore voltage in, in circuits. Now, Dr. Marshall and I have combined the concepts of healing as voltage, scalar energy, biofield tuning, biogeometry, emotion code, neurotherapy, etc., into a system that we call Tenet Scalar Emotional Tuning. Now let's look at toxins. All toxins are electron stealers and include bacteria, viruses, fungus, pesticides, heavy metals, uh, GMOs, etc. 
Now to understand that we can have an influence in those, uh, one has to realize that again, each of these has its own specific frequency. And by tuning these frequencies, we are able to resolve their toxic effect. So in summary then, we start out with a charged uh, battery that is a fully charged acupuncture circuit. But thyroid and scars and dental infections and emotions and toxins each are electron stealers and slowly began to drain the voltage in the, in the battery. And it's well known in battery technology uh, that if you take a rechargeable battery and you drain it all the way to zero, it will flip itself upside down, that is reverse its polarity. Once the polarity is reversed in the circuit, including the stomach circuit, then no matter what you do, you don't have the 50 millivolts to make new cells. And so chronic disease is inevitable. Now, what one must do then is use the scalar energy, which has the ability to flip the battery back up to normal polarity. And then you must recharge the battery uh, with the biomodulator. In order to keep it from flipping again, you have to address all of these things, thyroid scars, dental infections, emotions, and toxins. And so that is the, the methodology one uh, that we suggest in order to address chronic diseases, including macular degeneration. Now remember that in order to make new cells, not only you have to have the voltage, but you have to have all the materials it takes to make new cells. Patients often say, well, I want to just take one thing and find out if that thing, one thing will cure me. Well, if a tornado or a hurricane blows your house down, you can't build that house back with doorknobs and bathroom tiles, even though those are necessary components. You have to have all the things it takes to make a house and you have to have them all at the same time. So for that reason, we went through the physiology books and wrote down everything we could find that cells needed to make new cells. We went to a biochemist and asked her to put all of these things into a powder. Um, but the rules were no preservatives, no fillers, no GMO, no soy, everything methylated, everything in the purest form on the planet. So we came up with a nutritional system that provides everything that we can find that cells need to make new cells and to keep them running efficiently. So obviously to make new cells to restore function in the macula, we need the voltage, we need the, the nutrients. So all patients are recommended that they take the nutrients in addition to correcting the voltages as we've discussed. So what to expect? Well, we evaluate the function of the maculus by looking at both the physiology, visual acuity and electroretinogram, and the anatomy with the OCT. If there's too much scarring, we don't recommend therapy. We measure the stomach circuit and determine why it won't hold a charge. We look at the physiology, the anatomy, and the acuity, both before and after treatment. We correct the polarities and recharge the muscle battery packs with the biotransducer and the, and the biomodulator. We support oxygen levels with hyperbaric oxygen or level two therapy, which is a form of exercise with oxygen therapy. We put voltage directly into the macula with the biotransducer and we supply nutrition to make new cells and to restore nitric oxide, which controls oxygen availability. Often there's enough damage in the macula that improved vision is not possible. However, stopping the vision from getting worse is a worthwhile goal and often the only reasonable expectation. Remember that nothing can overcome a dental infection in the spleen stomach circuit. Such an infection is like a screwdriver in the wall as we've discussed. And so if people have an infection in the spleen stomach circuit teeth, one will not resolve the macular degeneration unless this is addressed appropriately. Legal disclaimers. Dr. Tent has been required by the American Board of Ophthalmology and the Texas Medical Board to not claim that he can slow progression of macular degeneration nor reverse it. Neither has ever evaluated Dr. Tennant's theories or results. Thus, I only provide both before and after scientific exams and allow them to speak to the, for themselves without making any claims. 
All I'm doing is presenting a theory of how macular degeneration might occur and how one might address that.